Hello. Welcome to lecture four of our course on advanced quantum mechanics. So remember <clears throat> um, what we've done last time. We started with the formulation of classical mechanics um, in Hamiltonian form. So on the top level, the most abstract level is the Hamiltonian, um, which is the total energy expression. And then from it, we can derive um, using the Poisson bracket and the Hamilton equations of motion, the concrete differential equations of motion for x, for the x, for the p, and for any other observable that you might be interested in. From solving, by solving these differential equations of motion, we obtain as their solutions functions, which we can solve for variables, uh, which have variables in them, which contain numbers, and these, number, these numbers are going to be our number predictions for the outcome of measurements. By the way, if my handwriting is worse today, it's because my tablet PC died this morning. I had to get some new uh, gadget, and I'm not yet used to this. So uh, the writing is not going to be very good at the beginning, at least. Um, so what did we do? We upgraded this classical mechanics formulation to quantum mechanics. And it looked like this. We have, again, a Hamiltonian. And to indicate that this is now quantum mechanics, let's put a hat over it. Um, so we have a Hamiltonian, which depends on the x hat and the p hat. Of course, they can have indices from one to three, and then maybe further indices to indicate a number of different particles, as usual. And then from that Hamiltonian, we can use the exact same axioms for the Poisson bracket, and the exact same abstract Hamilton equation. This is um, the Poisson bracket of f with h plus df dt to obtain again uh, a set of, or this set of differential equations of motion. What we have not done yet is this piece, namely how to find out how do we get from here somehow to numbers, to number predictions. How does this work? We don't know yet. Um, let us see. Let me now, if I can find the cursor. Okay. It does now take stock. Where are we? What have we really done here? We moved on this top level here, the Hamiltonian formulation from classical to quantum mechanics, and everything I mentioned so far didn't change. Hamiltonian, uh, Poisson brackets, axioms, the Hamilton equations of motion, all of that is the same, and therefore, the differential equations of motion of quantum mechanics will look exactly the same way that they look in classical mechanics. So what did change? Now, um, what was the upgrade? Well, the upgrade was that, first of all, the x hat and the p hat have hats. I said that this is because this is in quantum mechanics. True, but remember that there was something deeper behind this. Following Dirac, we now know that we should understand the x hat and the p hat to stand for, for operations. x hat and p hat are the names of operations that experimentalists can perform. Position measurements, momentum measurements. And we know that operations may not commute, such as the operation of 
going to the gym and the operation of having a shower. These two operations do not commute. It matters in which sequence you do these operations. And so Dirac said, okay, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's not assume that the X and the P have to be number valued functions of time. Um, let's allow them to be standing for operations. And um, then Dirac asked, well, if they do not commute, how can they be non-commutative? How can they be non-commutative without breaking down the entire framework that we had built up for classical mechanics? So, um, first of all, remember the definition, which is very convenient in the, this discussion. Um, if we have some a hat, which could be some polynomial in the x and the p, and another b hat, which could be some polynomial in the x and the p, then um, we define this to be the commutator. So a hat, b hat minus b hat, a hat. Um, and Dirac then showed, and we, we calculated this last time, Dirac showed that if the X and the P's are non-commutative, then these polynomials in the X and the P's ought to obey um, that A hat um, and B hat, that this commutator, has to be some number that still needs to be determined um, times the Poisson bracket of this a hat and this b hat. So Dirac was not able to calculate somehow what that number k has to be. But his achievement was to show that if this commutator, if a b minus b a is not zero, then it cannot be arbitrary. It's got to be proportional to the Poisson bracket between A and B, unless we risk breaking down the Poisson algebra structure, which may be worthwhile in order to incorporate gravity, but that's um, a very advanced topic. Okay, so this means that Dirac showed that in particular, if, um, the commutator between the xi and the pj is to be non-zero, well, it may be non-zero without breaking the structure of the Poisson algebra, but then it has to be proportional with this factor k to the Poisson bracket between xi and pj, um, which is of course, delta ij. And uh, in the same way, he found that um, therefore the uh, commutator between xi and xj um, has to be k times uh, x hat i, x hat j, the Poisson bracket of them. But since the Poisson bracket vanishes, this is zero. And if we choose for the capital A, capital B, now the P hat, then we obtain that these guys also have to commute. Right? Um, because the Poisson bracket vanishes, the commutator must vanish as well on the basis of Dirac's calculation that we performed last time. So this also meant that Dirac now was able to conclude that um, Hamilton's equation, um, namely that, oh, see, I'm not really used to this uh, yet, that Hamilton's equations dx by dt, remember that the x hat and the p hat and a hat and so on, they're all functions of the time. Um, 
we are just not writing this within brackets t all the time because it would make things a little tedious and a lot slower to write. So uh, one of Hamilton's equations is that this is the Poisson bracket of x hat with h hat and then there is no term d x hat by dt because well x hat is an elementary variable and there is I mean this is not a polynomial with time dependent coefficients it's just the term x hat so there is no explicit time dependence there's only the implicit time dependence that x hat is time dependent right so we have that this is true and therefore <clears throat> using now um, the um, uh, the finding of Dirac, we can conclude that this has to be 1 over k, and then it's the commutator of x hat with h hat. Right? Um, let me just go up here and show you where we take this from. So we have here the Poisson bracket of two expressions in x and p, and here we have the commutator of two expressions in x and p and they're related by k right we have that the commutator is k times the Poisson bracket let me remind you where was it oh here we have it it's right here the commutator of two expressions in x and p is k times the Poisson bracket of the two right so here we have this um, so we have um, this and we have, um, and we have that the p hat by dt is equal to the Poisson bracket of p hat with h hat. That's just the Hamilton equation. Um, and this then is one over k commutator of p hat with h hat. Now, this k, let me just tell you already what it is. I think I told you last time already, this k is ih bar. So we actually have, and just as a preview, we will later find out why there is an i in there and has to be an i in there. And later we will also find out how to make quantum mechanical predictions. And these quantum mechanical predictions depend in principle on k and they can be compared with experimental measurements and then you find out what value k has to take and it turns out k has to be i times Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So actually let me just put here preview you will find that k is equal to i h over 2 pi and um, h bar is um, h over 2 pi. Okay, so let me now write out these equations again um, because they get another name if we spell them out with the h bar and the commutators. So this is then um, 1 over i h bar, commutator of x hat with h hat, and the p hat by dt equal to 1 over i h bar, p hat by h. These two equations here are the so-called Heisenberg equations. Um, fortunately, we cannot just jump right in there now and solve those Heisenberg equations because we don't even know what kind of mathematical object the x hats 
and the P hat uh, should be. We only know what they cannot be. They cannot be number values because numbers commute. So what we will need to find out is what kind of object the X hat and the P hats can be. And then we can start solving these Heisenberg equations. Not used to this uh, new hardware yet. Now, there are two subtle points here that need to be addressed. Subtle points that should not be overlooked. <clears throat> um, first of all, in classical mechanics, we have that the x and the p are number valued and these numbers are real. So we have that um, xi star is equal to xi. Remember all of these are functions of time. We're just suppressing the bracket. Mm. And we have that the momenta are also real. Um, why is that? It is because in classical mechanics, we do not distinguish between the measurement operation and the measurement outcome. <clears throat> um, so these X and these P's are identified with the measurement outcomes and measurement outcomes are of course always real numbers. You read something off some measurement instrument and that's going to be a real number, a multiple of some basic unit. So these are numbers and these numbers are real. This is what we have in, uh, in classical mechanics. Now, um, this also means that if we have some functions of x and p, um, like f of x and p and g of x and p, and we take the um, complex conjugate of that, then we have, well, let me suppress the indices, uh, the, the brackets in here. Then we have that this is f star g star, right? which we can also write as G star F star because complex numbers are commutative. Okay, now in quantum mechanics, um, this is becoming non-trivial and we'll have to consider what happens to this star operation. In classical mechanics, this star operation stands for complex conjugation of numbers. But in quantum mechanics, the X and the P are not number valued. Ultimately, of course, we need to implement the constraint that the predictions of quantum mechanics will be for real number outcomes of measurements. So something like what we wrote down for classical mechanics should also hold true for quantum mechanics. We just don't know yet what exactly it's gonna be. So for now, let's put a placeholder there. So what we say is that in quantum mechanics, the X high, X i have a dagger operation. This object up here is called a dagger. Feynman calls it like that. Um, and we want that these objects, whatever they are in quantum mechanics, um, obey this property that X dagger is X. Just like in classical mechanics, X star was X. Um, and similarly, we require that under this to be determined operation of taking a dagger, um, also the momenta will have this property here. Now, when we have F's and um, G's, which are dependent of the X and the P's. So if F is a polynomial in X and P and G is a polynomial in the X hats and the P hats, then what should be the dagger of that? Now, it turns out that 
when we study what kind of objects the X and the P's should be, we will also find out what the dagger will be. And the properties of this dagger will be such that they are what is called an involution. And that means that we have G hat dagger, F hat dagger. This is just a preview of what's to come, but it's good to know this already. Um, and also because it's an involution, we will require that F dagger, and then we take another dagger of that is F again. So this is the same, of course, in, in classical mechanics, where we have that if we take F star, complex number, and then complex conjugated twice, we get F again, right? So we want to have all of that in quantum mechanics as well. Um, I.e., this operation dagger um, will be an involution. Um, technically, it's an anti algebra homomorphism. Okay, so Um, <clears throat> what does this mean now? This has practical consequences. It means, for example, um, uh, therefore, what we have that um, e.g. Hamiltonians Um, which are some polynomials in x hat and p hat, um, must obey um, because they stand for the energy, they must obey that h hat dagger um, x hat p hat is equal to h hat of x hat and p hat. Uh, when you evaluate this, um, notice um, a, oh, I should write a here. Let's say we have r dagger is equal to r star if R is a number, okay? So in quantum mechanics, we of course also have ordinary numbers. And this dagger operation um, will therefore also act on these numbers. For example, if you dagger a polynomial such as the Hamiltonian, then in this polynomial, there will be some numbers. And the dagger applied to the X hat and the P hat is what we just said. And the dagger applied to a complex number is the, con is the complex conjugate of that complex number. So you see that this is actually a non-trivial condition here. We need that h dagger is equal to h. Let me give you a counter example. So e.g., um, let's say h hat of x and p. Uh, if we define that to be p hat squared over 2m plus x hat p hat times some number alpha, okay? Not okay. Not okay. And why is that, that not okay? This cannot be the Hamiltonian of a quantum mechanical system. Well, it's because um, because um, h hat dagger for this Hamiltonian is equal to p hat squared over 2m, right? Because p hat dagger is p hat, so that first term stays the same. But then we have plus alpha star, alpha is some number, 
some prefactor that makes the units right. And then we have p hat dagger x hat dagger. The daggers go away, but remember that we had this rule up here. It's a subtle point, but important. We have this rule here um, that we are using at this moment, what I'm boxing here in the yellow. See, if you have two expressions in X and P, two polynomials in X and P, F hat and G hat, then if you take the dagger of that, you're changing the sequence in which they occur. Right, so F hat, G hat dagger is G hat dagger, F hat. And what that means is that H hat, that H hat dagger is this, which is not the same as H hat. So this is not the same as H hat. This is why there's a problem. This cannot occur as a Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics because it wouldn't uh, lead to real number value predictions as we will later see. So this leads us to make a certain number of definitions. Let me just write def for definition. Uh, definition is um, <clears throat> Um, f hat x hat p hat is called an observable if f hat dagger is f hat because then the predictions of quantum mechanics for the outcome of measuring f, hat or f um, will be real number predictions and that's reasonable. This might be observable in practice. It doesn't mean that there actually exists a measurement apparatus that could measure this, but it's potentially observable. Whereas if that was not the case, if that condition didn't hold f dagger is f, then there's no chance that it could be measurable because the outcomes would be predicted to be complex numbers other than real numbers. And another definition, namely, um, uh, if f hat dagger equal to f, then um, f hat is called Hermitian. Permission is the term that replaces the term real in quantum mechanics. So these expressions in X and P are not real or not real. They are Hermitian or non Hermitian. Those of you who have taken some functional analysis may know that there is a difference between the terms Hermitian, symmetric, and self-adjoint. For now, let's go with the term Hermitian and the subtle differences between these terms. Um, I will explain later in the course. For now, let's go with the definition for Hermitian only. <clears throat> so now we can um, say more about this mysterious K that turned out to be IH bar. Because now, um, we can look again at what Dirac found. Dirac found that x hat p hat minus p hat x hat had to be k times the Poisson bracket of x hat and p hat, which is to say that it had to be k. Um, and now using, um, uh, Oh, this is so hard to write on this. So now using um, that x hat is x hat dagger is x hat, p hat dagger is p hat, and and that f 
hat g hat dagger is g hat dagger f hat dagger um, we can conclude um, by taking the Hermitian conjugate of that of that equation here that is to say by taking the dagger of it so if we take the dagger of that we have that x hat p hat minus p hat x hat dagger equal to k well k is a number so we can put a star here um, but this is equal to um, x hat p sorry um, i looked at the wrong term here so these two trade places under the emission conjugation um, under this dagger operation here that oh uh, yeah sorry i should have said the dagger operation <coughs> acquires the name emission conjugation it's just like a complex conjugation you have emission conjugation so we have p hat x hat minus x hat p hat is equal to k star right but um this means that um k star is minus k right because if you compare with this equation here so this equation and that equation together mean that um, k is equal to minus k star therefore k is imaginary so quite paradoxically quantum mechanics must necessarily contain complex numbers in order to be able to make real valued predictions for experiments all right, so k is imaginary, and remember what I already mentioned, experiment says that k has to be equal to i, that's what we just found, multiplied with some real number, and that real number experiment determines to be h bar. All right. <clears throat> Of course, still we don't know how to actually make predictions. Um, so I'm anticipating this here, but it would be tedious to carry the K around uh, for much longer when, of course, eventually it's just IH bar. Okay, there is another subtle point. Um, we said that the equations of motion in quantum mechanics are exactly the same as the equations of motion of classical mechanics on the grounds that the Hamiltonian is the same, the Poisson brackets are the same, they have this exactly the same axioms, and the Hamilton equation is the same. So formally, these two equations of motion look identical. The only difference seems to be that in classical mechanics, we are looking for solutions that are number-valued functions of time, x of t and p of t, and in quantum mechanics, we are looking for weirder solutions that not only obey the differential equations, but that also are non-commutative in a very special way. It's more subtle than this. And the reason is that actually, in principle, um, the equations of motion can be different for a subtle reason. They usually are not, but for a very subtle reason, they may sometimes be. And the reason is that quantum mechanics um, has <coughs> a richer set of Hamiltonians. You see, consider a Hamiltonian of the form, let's say, free particle p squared over 2m plus, and then I'm writing something like some prefactor alpha. And then let's say xp minus px hat 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 times some polynomial of the x hat and the p hat. 
let's assume I'm arranging the polynomial to be such and the number alpha to be such that the units are in order and that h hat is formally Hermitian. Well, then um, this is a, in principle a perfectly eligible Hamiltonian. And this term matters because xp minus px is not zero in quantum mechanics, right? Because they don't commute. This is actually ih bar. So we have alpha ih bar f of whatever this is. But if we write down the exact same <coughs> Hamiltonian um, in classical mechanics, the exact same Hamiltonian is actually p squared over 2m plus nothing. Because the xp minus px term, and so the whole thing on the right hand side drops out. So what this means is that there are many Hamiltonians of quantum mechanics that reduce to the same Hamiltonian in classical mechanics. Namely, all those Hamiltonians that have xp minus px terms in them, all those Hamiltonians that have terms in them that are proportional to h bar or some power of h bar. In principle, experiment would have to decide which is the correct um, quantum Hamiltonian. <clears throat> but it turns out that generally, you can neglect terms like that. And the quantum Hamiltonian indeed looks as simple as it could possibly be, namely the same way that the classical Hamiltonian looks like, which means also that the equations of motion are um, exactly looking the same. Again, there are some subtle examples where this kind of thing, these ordering ambiguities matter. Um, this can come up in quantum field theory. And in particular, it has been proposed that in order to quantize gravity, such ordering ambiguities might not be so harmless and there might be some non-trivial things to consider there. Um, if you'd like to know some literature about this, I can point you in this um, <clears throat> direction. This whole thing goes under the name of ordering ambiguities. <clears throat> okay, at this point, we are now ready to start investigating the big question, namely, what on earth are these x hat and p hat? So x hat and p hat are not numbers. or number valued, number valued functions. What are they? I'm sorry that my handwriting is so bad. Um, I'm trying to get a hang of this. You see, I'm seeing what I'm writing on the screen, but the pad on which I'm writing um, uh, doesn't show what I'm writing. So. Um, I have to guess where to put down the cursor. Right. What could they possibly be? What we do know is that x hat minus p hat, uh, no, not minus, multiplied with, sorry about that, that x hat p hat minus p hat x hat whatever objects in mass they are, um, they have to be something that is um, a multiple of the number one or some object like that. It's, it's, it's ih bar on the right hand side, it's not zero. So let us ask, um, what kind of objects do we know in mathematics that are non-commutative? Now, two things come to mind immediately, and luckily, we can get away with just those two. Um, first is differentiation and multiplication are um, non-commutative of the right kind for quantum mechanics. So um, we notice 
um, multiplication and differentiation don't commute. See, whether you first multiply a function with a variable and then differentiate with respect to that variable, or you do it the other way around, it matters. Uh, let me show you. So, for example, um, let's say we do d by d lambda after multiplying with lambda, um, and we take the function sine of lambda. Now, what is this? So, um, this is going to be sine of lambda um, plus lambda cosine of lambda by the product rule, right? Um, on the other hand, let's do those two operations, you know, just like going to the gym and then showering or first showering and then going to the gym. Here, we first multiply and then differentiate or the other way around. So now let's do it the other way around. Now we first differentiate um, and then multiply with lambda, right? And then what do we get? Well, in this case, we get lambda times cosine of lambda. And you see, hey, there's a term missing. It's not the same, right? So therefore, we can tell that the two operations, um, <coughs> uh, d by d lambda, if we just write it like this as an operation without specifying on which function it acts, this operation, the operation of differentiating with respect to lambda, does not commute with the operation of multiplying with lambda. Okay, so um, notice what we are writing down here. This is uh, a slightly unusual notation because but it's something, it's a notation that is very common in quantum mechanics. So it's good to get used to this early on. Lambda here doesn't stand for a number. Number. Lambda here doesn't stand for a variable either. This lambda stands for the operation of multiplying a function with lambda. And d by d lambda stands for the operation of differentiating a function with respect to lambda. And this equation expresses that these two operations generally don't commute. What their commutator is, we will later calculate, and we will find that it offers us an opportunity. This business of the non-commutativity of the app derivative <coughs> operator with the multiplication operator offers us an opportunity to actually express the x hat and the p hat um, mathematically, as we will see. But there's another thing that's non-commutative that we should also explore and that will be very useful um, right from the beginning. Um, so what we also notice is that um, matrices are non-commutative. Matrices are non-commutative to two. And you may have seen this when you multiply two matrices, A and B, then AB doesn't have to be the same as BA. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. It depends on the matrices in question. So let's see. Um, let's try something out. Are there matrices A hat and B hat, or oh, oh, let's just cut out the hat for the moment because this is just in the algebra what we are doing now. Are there matrices A and B um, which obey um, that AB minus BA is um, um, K times the identity matrix? K could be chosen to be IH bar, for example. So if we can find matrices for which this is true, 
Well, that would be great because then we could say, hmm, in classical mechanics, the position and the momentum variables are functions of time, uh, number valued functions of time. And then we would simply jump to quantum mechanics and say, all right, in quantum mechanics, x of t and p of t are matrix valued functions of time. And we would pick such matrices, matrices that obey these commutation relations for that purpose. Wouldn't that be great? Then we would know what we'd have to do to solve a quantum mechanical problem, namely solve <clears throat> this problem, this linear algebra problem. And then once we have found such matrices, then we just have to find their time evolution too with the equations of motion. Fortunately, um, there is some um, obstacle here. Namely, there are no such matrices that would obey such an equation. There cannot exist any such matrices. Let's say, um, uh, assume um, A, B exist and act on Rn, or if you like, on Cn. It doesn't really matter. So the n-dimensional complex vector space, so n-dimensional real vector space. Well, then we can derive a contradiction. You see, let's take the trace of this equation. Then we have that the trace of AB minus BA is equal to uh, the trace of K, which is a number times the identity matrix. Now, remember what the trace is, right? The trace is the sum of the diagonal elements of, of the matrix. So let's evaluate that. This is, um, of course, additive here. So we have the trace of um, AB minus the trace of BA equal to, now the trace is linear, so we can pull this out, trace of one. Now, what is this? <clears throat> um, this is the sum of A, I, J, B, J, I. You see, this J summation um, multiplies the matrix A with the matrix B. And then we sum up the diagonal terms of the resulting matrix. That's why we sum over all I as well. Minus, and then this one is sum I, J, and then here we have B, I, J, A, J, I. But you see, if we just rename things, if we rename the I and the J, um, then we will see that there's a problem. First of all, what is the trace of the identity matrix? Well, it's n, right? If the dimension of our vector space is n, then this trace is n. So what we obtain is that, first of all, this is equal to that. Because remember, these are matrix elements. The matrix elements are numbers, and they commute. So I, we can swap the b and the a here, and then if we just rename the i and the j, we find out this is equal to zero. No matter what the matrices A and B are, this is zero. The trace of a commutator is always zero. But this is supposed to be K times N. And we have that lightning goes into this. This cannot work. It's a contradiction, right? If K is equal to I H bar, it's not zero. And the dimension, whatever it is, uh, it's got to be some finite dimension, um, cannot work. There are no n by n matrices which obey the commutation relations that quantum mechanics requires. So you might think, okay, that's bad news. Let's forget about matrices. Fascinatingly, we, make, we can make here our first prediction <coughs> for quantum mechanics. So let's say observation of quantum mechanics. Namely that quantum mechanics requires infinite dimensions. It turns out that when the dimension of our vector space is infinite, then this trace operation is non-trivial 
because we have to sum here um, infinitely many terms. And, you know, that can be non-trivial if you have to take two of those limits here. And in any case, the trace here is divergent for n going to infinity. And we end up with both sides of this equation being ill-defined. Now, you might think, okay, but that just means that you can't make that argument with the trace. That's my point. When the dimension of the vector space is infinite, this trace argument fails. And there may be a chance that we find matrices that obey the commutation relations that um, quantum mechanics requires, namely these ones, AB minus BA equal to K times the identity. And indeed, that exists. And let me give you those matrices. Oh, I mean, they're not unique. Uh, Oop, oh, there we go. So, indeed, um, A, B minus B, A is equal to K times the identity matrix um, for the following matrices on infinite, infinite dimensional vector spaces, which is to say matrices that are infinite by infinite in size. So on the diagonal, we have zeros, goes on like that. And then here we have a square root of one, square root of one, square root of two, square root of two, square root of three, square root of three, etc. And here all of these and all of those are zero. And then we have a matrix B um, that we define, oh, we put here a number L and the number L is just some arbitrary real number. And then um, I'm just putting this L here to illustrate that um, we have arbitrariness in this. Uh, there are many matrices that obey these commutation relations, infinitely many in fact, but I'm giving you an example here. Um, a sec. Okay, so we define B to be K divided by two L and then we have here again zeros on the diagonal. And then we put here square root of one, square root of two, sorry, minus square root of one, minus square root of two, minus square root of three, minus square root of four. And here square root one, square root two, square root three, etc. All of those and all of those zero. And then I'll leave it to you as an exercise that this is true. Exercise. <clears throat> Check that indeed the commutator of A and B is equal to K times the identity. And therefore, at some point in time, in some choice of bases in vector spaces, the X hat and the P hat of quantum mechanics of some quantum mechanical system might be represented by exactly such matrices. And as we will find out, that is indeed um, the case. Now, this phenomenon that quantum mechanics can be done with matrices, but only if you have them infinite by infinite, that was the beginning of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was not discovered by Schrödinger. Schrödinger was the second. The first to discover um, quantum mechanics half a year before Schrödinger was Heisenberg. And Heisenberg did a calculation exactly like this. And you see, this exercise is a little tedious here <laughs> to multiply those matrices and to verify that, that this is actually true. It's not hard to calculate, but tedious. And how would you have expected that this is how it comes out? Well. Heisenberg had hay fever and had to escape because it was so bad and they didn't have antihistamines at the time or whatever. So he escaped to uh, an island uh, somewhere in the North Sea um, where there were less pollen and so he didn't suffer of the hay fever. But of course he was bored to death there because there was just nothing going on. And in his spare time, he worked out that and he found hay. Quantum mechanics can be done in this way 
if we replace the usual X and the P by matrices. And therefore the first formulation of quantum mechanics was matrix mechanics, or I mean, it's still the same quantum mechanics, but it was called matrix quantum mechanics. Um, Heisenberg, and I think it was in 1925, if I remember correctly. Um, this is how um, quantum mechanics was first um, uh, discovered. Um, what you notice here too is that this number L is arbitrary. Um, that demonstrates that there is not just one set of matrices A and B which obey the quantum mechanical commutation relations and of course they shouldn't. You see the X hat and the P hat are not frozen in quantum mechanics. The position changes, the momentum changes, they're, they're dynamical variables, right? We have x hat of t and p hat of t, which means that um, x hat of t will be a matrix valued function of time. p hat of t will be a matrix valued function of time. And their time dependence will be, that is to say the time dependence of the matrix elements will be determined by the equations of motion. And at any point in time, the commutation relations between X and the X's and the P's will be as determined by quantum mechanics. So you see, we have now our work cut out for ourselves. We have to solve the dynamical equations of motion, which look like those of classical mechanics, but much harder to do. I mean, once you get the hang of it, it's not that much harder, but it's harder to do than in classical mechanics because we're not just solving these equations of motion for number valued functions, but now for matrix valued functions. Fortunately, once you know a few good matrices of which you know how they commute, then you can often put the time dependence, the required time dependence in prefactors, and then that makes the whole thing um, pretty easy. And um, we can then solve um, quantum mechanical problems this way. So, um, <clears throat> where are we now? Um, let's just take stock of where we are. Um, um, well, we have at the top level of abstraction a Hamiltonian and we obtain now the differential equations of motion of motion and we can express them in the Hamilton form with Poisson brackets but we can also express them um, in the Heisenberg form namely we can write them as dx hat by dt um, equal to 1 over i h bar commutator of x hat i with h hat y just to remind you it's because this is equal to the Poisson bracket right x hat i with h hat remember that the Poisson bracket Dirac showed has to be proportional to the commutator and the proportionality factor is k or i h bar okay and then similarly we have the dp hat i by dt is equal to 1 over i h bar. Um, oh, this is a p hat i h hat. Okay, so we have this much. And that's already a lot because it means, as we just said a minute ago, we have our work cut out for ourselves because what we now know what we have to solve. We need to solve these differential equations together with <coughs> um, the commutation relations x hat i p hat j equal to i h bar delta i j and of course also that the x's commute among each other and the p commute among each other. So we have some technical work cut out for ourselves. We have to solve differential equations namely these the Heisenberg equations of motion and we have to solve those commutation relations all at the same time. We anticipate it's 
a matrix problem. There will also be another formulation, um, Schrodinger's formulation, for example. Um, but this is one way of looking at it. Um, and it's the more direct, it's the most direct way of looking at it because it's the closest to classical mechanics because um, the equations of motion are the same. We only have to also solve the commutation relations along with these equations of motion. And where we are now is that, or where we are now going next is that from here, we need to find out how we get to <coughs> number predictions. See, it's all good and fine to be able to solve the differential equations along with the commutation relations. But what do we have at the end of the day? Then we have matrix valued functions of time. Or if we don't do it with matrices, if we do it with multiplication and derivatives and so on, whichever, it's some weird thing, not number valued function of time. And we need to find out how to make then predictions for experiments. So we have to climb down that ladder of abstraction. We have to find out what the lower rungs on that ladder are. We have the differential equations. We have to find out what these um, uh, non-number valued functions of time are, the x hat of t and p hat of t. Matrix valued functions is a possibility. And then from there, we have to boil it down to number valued functions of time. And then we can get numbers from that and that will, those will be the predictions. So this is what we will do next. Um, find out how we can get predictions out of um, quantum mechanics. Okay, so um, um, this is it for today.